Welcome to a Germs Journey discussion. I'm Rob Watson. Over a series of three conversations, a group of practitioners and advocates of community-focused health and community media are coming together to talk about the challenge of public health messages and information in Leicester. Hello and welcome to a Germs Journey discussion. Our third conversation will explore the role of community-focused stories to overcome the challenges of public health education. We'll discuss how the use of community stories and personal testimony can be an effective way to support community trust and understanding on issues of public health. The sharing of stories and testimony associated with community media is well used around the world to raise awareness about public well-being and healthcare behaviours. Community stories are founded on shared community knowledge and when they work well, they also become platforms for empowerment and inclusion. Our conversation will consider how local and tacit social experience can be adapted to better support healthcare information that addresses practical well-being needs. We'll also ask how can we use positive and locally relevant stories to counter misinformation, build trust, and thereby facilitate better access to healthcare and social wellbeing services? Can community focused and community led storytelling and testimony make a difference? What do we need to do to facilitate these stories? And how do we do this accountably and in a mutually supportive manner? If our aim is to enhance trust and awareness between all residents of Leicester, what is it that we need to do to make this work? Joining us today are Zamzam Yusuf, who is an Action Research Officer at Leicester Shakers, Charmin Sulman, who has worked in research governance and public health and has worked extensively in community radio and facilitates online communities. John Costa is the Director of the Documentary Media Centre and previously ran Citizen's Eye, a community news agency based here in Leicester, and Dr Indrani Lahari, a senior lecturer in media and communication. Indrani's research focuses on digital media, society and politics. Thanks for being here today. I'm sure we're going to have a very engaging conversation. Can I start with a quick fire question for each of you? Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do? And do you think we've done a good job engaging with people in Leicester about the COVID-19 pandemic? I'm going to go around my screen. So, Charmaine, you're first. Um, well, hello, everyone. So, as Rob mentioned, I've done quite a bit of work over the years in community media, particularly in um, with the Ramadan radios. So, just a bit of background. Um, many communities up and down the UK, the last count there were over 20 communities up and down the UK, get a, a short term license for the month of Ramadan to broadcast. And this is something that I've been involved with for almost two decades now, on and off. And um, this last year was particularly challenging because we were hit with the pandemic just um, and it posed a series of challenges which we had to navigate in terms of not just getting out on the airways, but also trying to use the platform to engage with people about what the pandemic meant, how it was going to affect their lives, how they could keep themselves safe. Um, with regards to your sort of second point, Rob, about um, Leicester and uh, you're going to have to repeat that second point too. It was a very long question, Rob. Have we have we dealt with the pandemic well in terms of our communications? I think there's always room for improvement. Um, one of the things about the pandemic, I think, was that w when it first hit, there was a lot of unknowns, you know, and the science in many respects, people kept on, well, we need to follow the science, but people weren't sure what the science was and the science was changing as the information and the data kept coming in as well. Uh, I think there were national efforts, but there was perhaps on a grassroots level, uh, more could have been done looking back. And I think it's quite useful to look back and think about how we could have improved things. Um, but one of the things for me, I think, was that there were a lot of soundbites about stay at home and so forth. 
but how to translate those, not just in terms of translating them in terms of language, but also think about how to make them meaningful for local communities at a grassroots level. Um, and that's something that I sort of witnessed and saw and um, tried to do something about with the radio platform. Sam Sam, how about you? How's your work uh, through Leicestershire Cares been shaped over the last 12 months? So um, I'm carrying out an action research project which explores the strengths, issues and challenges and opportunities that are experienced by African, uh, Afro-Caribbean, Asian communities in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rotland, um, as well as Eastern European communities. Um, in terms of what we've done as Leicestershire Cares, I mean, we've, we've been very active in supporting the community and stuff. Um, we've also created a couple of podcasts in different languages because we acknowledged, obviously, with um, pandemics hitting, communities was not getting um, the correct information feeding through to them. So we had to sort of um, speak with communities as a role, as, my, as a part of my community development role. Um, and what we identified was the barrier, language barrier, where you know, people were not understanding the information that was coming uh, from the um, public health. Um, so what we done is we've created, we teamed up with local doctors, um, as well as trusted voices, community leaders within um, within different communities, uh, the Polish community, the Somali community, the Gujarati, Gujarati community and Romanian communities, and sort of created a podcast in their languages. So we, you know, we can cascade and that was very successful. Um, terms of it was viewed worldwide um, so you could see the needs of people actually wanting to listen and hear um, about you know what COVID is the vaccine all the rest of it um, which is like bad information and it's coming from a um, trusted place that makes sense. Indrani in what's your what's your experience been? Yeah so you know, I'm a, a lecturer in media and comms in Dimon Port University. And of course, as a lecturer in media and comms, I think the pandemic um, gave us some new um, areas to look at. And I believe that, you know, it's made more to do with the social psychology side of media, but also how, you know, you're sending out health comms messages and how that's been interpreted by the community is very important. So during this time, I, I believe that, you know, the work that we have mostly done around digital media and society, of course, I mean, lots of people have been using digital platforms, but we are forgetting that when they're using digital platforms, they're staying and sitting down in one place rather than moving around. And that brings in whole lots of physical and mental health issues as well. You know, not only that, there are stressful eyes, there are um, problems in kind of uh, retaining your memory and all of that happening, so people complaining about that. And then we have to think about, okay, can we actually... Um, go back and seek help from doing meditations or doing something which will take us away from this digital space. So I think there have been lots of conversations, but when it comes to the public health communications and how that's been, um, you know, circulated or has been disseminated within the um, population, I would say there is a serious gap in how um, they have been, you know, whether they be translating into different languages also thinking about the cultural context because language and culture both of them play a quite quite a critical role when it comes to um, any kind of health communication so interpretation and how they are accepting your message is also very important so i found that there is certain gap um, that we have noticed for the for the last one year or so to see you know um, that has that has got a space that can be um, that we can come in and kind of build. So possibly more to come from the conversation today. John, how have you experienced that gap, that space? Has it has it moved around you, shifted around you? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, uh, as 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 a as a journalist that runs the Documentary Media Centre, which is like an, an independent museum, archive, and library, then. You know, we run a project called Parallel Lives Network, which is right across the global south. So, you know, we, we've kind of had to turn the museum inside out because we're close to the public. Um, and that gave us an opportunity to do a lot of online newsrooms and stuff. So we've been helping a lot of our, our colleagues and friends who are active and proactive documentarians and people that run sort of smaller NGOs that most people wouldn't know about. 
to, to get their messages out. And a lot of it is around sort of public health, communicating where they are in the most effective way. And I think, you know, even as a, even as an educator, you know, working part time at, at the same university as Indrani, you know, teaching media production on Com Arts. I mean, I've just seen my students this week and, and, and last week, and this is the last week of teaching, but I've not seen them since the beginning of December face to face. And so to see the impact on a normally quite resilient age group um, has actually been quite um, been quite shocking for me. You know, having two boys the same age, you know what I mean? You're starting to sort of think about, well, who's doing really well and who isn't doing well. And so I think being here in Leicester and knowing Leicester reasonably well now from doing Citizen's Eye for seven years, um, we used to have a really good community media network and a really good community network as well, which was activated twice during the English Defence League challenges of 2010 and 2012. And I think it worked really effectively. And I would say that our eye has been taken off the ball here in the city to the point where all of those things have been allowed to disappear due to the fact that we're just assuming everybody is using Facebook. Um, of course, we're under the dangerous illusion that everybody listens to Radio Leicester and reads the Mercury um, to mainstream media platforms that have become increasingly irrelevant for some of our, the communities in our city and don't represent our city at all. Um, and so you suddenly have this public health challenge where suddenly there's the gap between the haves and the have nots, the, the have a gardens and the don't have a gardens. Um, those that are in you know zero hour contracts have to go to work, uh, but know the boss is claiming their furlough and keeping the money. Um, and this is all being played out in the mainstream media in a very much uh, a way of blaming certain communities. And I noticed today as well on Radio Leicester, it said that, you know, we've got, they've identified three cases of the India variant here in the city. And I think it's been very clever the way the mainstream media has got us all focused on who to blame. It's very much a blame culture that we get from the, from the mainstream media. And I think it's only community media, community radio in particular, is still one of the only ways that we're able to positively challenge the mainstream media's messages um, because, you know, community media has not really filled that gap with newspapers to rival the Mercury, which we've attempted in the past and we didn't succeed because no one was interested. So we've got to move beyond social media and start thinking about how we can use the local community stations that we have um, and start engaging people in, in that way where we're in it on our own. You know, what I mean, they literally don't care about us. And if we don't coordinate and make it work at the grassroots from a community media perspective, I don't think we'll be able to do it. Did we do a good job? Yes. Did we do it well? Did we do it well enough? Was it effective enough? No, not not by long chalk. But you know full well that there won't be that kind of conversation afterwards because the truth hurts. And the truth is that there are people that we just don't and cannot communicate with with the systems that we have in place now. Charmaine. Uh, your experience in community radio, what's your approach in terms of bringing people in to share their, uh, their, their concerns, their con you know, when you're producing content and you're training people and advising people, what is it that you have as a kind of list of things that you want them to understand about the approach, which is different from what they've got from other forms of media? I think the key thing is when we're talking about community radio, any kind of community project, it draws on volunteers from within the community. So your first sort of point is you've got people who know the grassroots, who are part of that grassroots culture in the first place, who can speak and understand their community in a way that isn't, isn't necessarily understood at a higher or national level. And that's the first thing. The second thing is really the approach. It's not about clickbait titles or headlines. It's about getting the messages that the community needs to keep safe, to develop itself, to build our social capital. And so in order to do that, it's really sort of thinking about who, who can we bring in, you know, training volunteers to understand and look for the, you know, the experts in the field who are part of community, who are trusted, who are known, um, look for new and upcoming people, because it's not just about the same old faces, it's about bringing in new people and drawing, drawing, making that pool uh, of um, experts available and that knowledge and expertise more available and accessible and relevant, thinking about how it's relevant to them. You know, one of the things about the pandemic, as I said, one of the things that for me I sort of saw was that when we talk about the pandemic, people think about epidemi epidemiology, they think about all the sort of science subjects, they think about behavior, uh, behavioral 
aspects to it. They think about virology, the genomic sequencing, but actually the heart of it was how we communicate what's going on. And, you know, the fact is, you know, people said we were stuck in our homes. So how do we deal with that? How do we get those messages across? The other key thing was about signposting. I think this is really important in the community media. It's always about signposting. The questions, a lot of people just don't know. I mean, one of the things people say, oh, well, it's all available online. You just have to Google it. Well, actually, it's not as simple as that, you know. Um, and so signposting, making it easier to, for people to find information, but not just any information. The other key sort of phrases I used to come up online, particularly on Facebook, and I, I run quite a few communities on Facebook. So one of the key things that used to come up there is do your own research. It's actually quite difficult to do your own research. You know, how do you distinguish between something which is robust um, and um, accurate and genuine as opposed to somebody just cherry picking, um, cherry picking a few facts and mixing it in like a tutti frutti mix. Um, and for the general population, general people who don't have any research skills or ability to identify the differences, those differences, it's easy to become misled um, by what's out there. So that's another thing. One of the other things we were quite conscious about, Rob, with, particularly with the with the Ramadan radio, having had one of having had um, one of the other community radios sanctioned for misinformation around COVID, if you remember. Um, was to make sure that we weren't part of that. So that was a really key thing. And one of the things was to make our um, volunteer presenters particularly understand they're not experts in the pandemic. I mean, it's impossible to be an expert on every aspect of the pandemic at any rate, but know where you are, know where to signpost. This is really key. I've heard programs in the past where people have just said, oh, I'm not really sure what the latest data is. That's not good enough. You need to know where to find that and be able to signpost it. I mean, even with, for example, the non-COVID harms we're talking about, injury, injury, race and things I never even thought about earlier. But, you know, domestic violence was one of those. So we had a show, we put together a show that somebody came forward who has experience, who's got a PhD looking into this kind of thing. And I said, okay, run with it. Find me the people who need to be on there, you know, get it together, put the signposting in place, and then once we had that program in place, when people were asking about this on Facebook, you know, where can we find help? Here's the show, here's the link. And it's making that content then go further as well. So it's having that very sort of holistic approach to it and thinking really putting the community or what the community needs at the heart of it, not just thinking about ratings, the listenership, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and even then that said, we doubled last year, the online listenership doubled. Um, during the pandemic. And that was phenomenal because that content was, it was working, people were listening and they were benefiting it. And, you know, the feedback was really good afterwards as well. So this is just some, some sort of thoughts, but, you know, for me is the signposting thing is really important. I think it's something that we miss a lot of the time. We get people who talk and can talk and talk, but actually when someone's at the end of the show, they need to be able to say, well, actually, or, 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 or they posted online in Facebook community, yeah, where do I find this? These are your sources. This is what's trusted. This is why it's trusted, you know, and, and this is what you need to look at. And this is where you're going to find the help that you need. Samzad, and that brings me to really, it kind of springboards into asking you a question about the process that you went through to create the podcasts and the thinking and, and action research is about adaptation and changing mm. as you learn from experience. Uh, what was what was that process like for you, and what did you learn from that? I mean, it was it wasn't an easy process. Um, for one, I had to um, um, obviously find people that was willing to be on online and and do the and do the work and uh, with me and do the podcast. Um, but it, it wasn't easy because obviously, again. Um, uh, it was, for example, for you, what you were doing today, so writing a script, uh, which was being translated into different languages, and then getting somebody that, you know, asking the community, who's your trusted voices, um, and getting that person involved in the process as well, and a doctor, because obviously, um, you know, they need to hear from a reliable source, even though they're not an expert, expert on what um, is happening, um, 
in some aspect they can you know advise and guide um the communities um and i suppose it was a good idea because um you know it is someone that they can relate to someone that they can you know someone that's speaking their own language someone that they can also um you know they can have their contact details and they can follow up with any follow-up questions and stuff um so the process was was not easy but it was one that needed to be done and the one that was needed um for the community to have in place indrani what what is it that builds trust in communications well i think that this is um very much to do with our working memory and our long-term memory you know so when you are giving some sort of information to the public it has got something that i'm when i'm reading it and processing it so that's my working memory when i'm working on it and then i have got behind a a, a historical past if you like it that way which is kind of a long term memory where i have got um different kinds of symbols representations you know understanding so as my working memory is working uh behind from behind the scene my long term memory interferes now if they don't match up that's where the conflict starts yeah so that's where then i try to um think about different other interpretations i try and think to build that story so to build that trust as you were asking you know what what makes it trustworthy information if it comes as a fact and not as an opinion then it becomes easier for people to understand and process it because there is this some sort of cognitive mechanism that fits into that process you know so we we know that okay there is a picture and with this picture there are certain texts going and i can sync that in my brain if i don't if i can't sync that either i'm not going to look at it or i'm going to look at it but think about uh in a in a more kind of a negative light so positive information or facts when they have gone out to people that has been very well accepted whereas when there have been whatsapp you know intervention of if you like during the pandemic sharing of lots of information and stories and all of that and then saying what to do what to drink and you know how to heat up or get cold or whatever you know those kind of messages then kind of created that sense of fear because here was the media who was showing that you know you know it acted as a public reminder of mortality yeah and then here is these stories where people are saying well this can be done and it can work out like very much um, like what um you know shamin was saying before that if you have to you know if what you are seeing and believing if it doesn't have a context uh then it becomes quite quite difficult to process for that individual um so therefore i believe that to make it trustworthy you need to think about the readers working knowledge and long term um understanding or information around a situation whether they be a crisis situation around a pandemic or something else and john we've kind of um had a media response which is only ha- hasn't recognized that many people don't have the same long term memories or the same short term kind of processing um at that time it's been a whole set of assumptions made that there's almost like a a single way to communicate um in 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 local terms from the communication that we've seen locally do you think that's that we've overcome that kind of problem or do you think we've adapted to the variations and the the multicultural uh uh nature of Leicester no <laughs> um i would say if i go back to the days of citizens i where you know there was always an assumption um and again you know it com- it comes down to you know whether it's you know systemic racism and, and you know it's one of those things that we've still not grasped that nettle and dealt with that you know basically the color of your skin is there's there's an assumption that um if you got a group of white people together yeah and said all get on yeah what they'll do is they'll start pointing out all their differences what post coast you're from what football team you support what your politics are and all that sort of stuff yet somehow this messaging comes down from on above and just says this is for the uh, african caribbean community 
and people just go, well, that doesn't mean that they all use the same radio station or they don't all read the same thing, you know? Um, and then it'll be like, you know, the, uh, the um, I don't know, the, uh, I'm, I'm doing a project with the Ugandan Asians at the moment. Yeah. So the Ugandan Asians are united by this 1972 story, but they're all completely different. But from the perspective of, of, of a communication, it will come down that this is for the Ugandan Asian community. Now, if you start bringing in stereotypes, you know what I mean? So, you know, Charmin and Zamzam are both wearing headscarves at the moment. Yeah. But so the assumption is that you guys must know each other, that you obviously socialize, you know what I mean? And uh, you do things together. And I said, well, where did that come from? And I think we've got this nationally and it's reinforced by government and it's reinforced by, you know, public health messaging. It's reinforced by police and the police and crime education um, right through down to local authority and obviously the role the media plays that suddenly this messaging it's like we've we've communicated with that community tick why because we sent a press release to one person okay and so what happens then is you've got all of these people that have missed out i, I, I alluded to it at the beginning you know those that have internet access and those that don't i mean we're just off we're just off between charles street and granby street now on granby street there's an amazing lovely big very fancy customer service center for the city council. Okay, it's been shut the whole time. Okay, so we're automatically assuming now that everybody's got access to the internet. Well, not everybody has because all the libraries have been shut as well. Okay, and so when we start talking about the haves and the have nots, we're not just talking about gardens or secure jobs or childcare or, or food in the cupboard. We're starting to talk about being able to access information. And so every time we try to deal with these situations we never seem to have the conversation that we need to be having which is about we can't build back better because it wasn't in the right place so yes we can be build back better than it was before but it wasn't right to start with you know that 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 inequality and that lack of access to information is not there and of course once again let's translate this into this language tick but it's not just doing that, it's then finding, you know, as Zamzam was saying, and Zamzam does very well with Leicestershire Cares, is actually then identifying the right people to speak to, those that actually represent the community, rather than those that sit on, on boards with the city council claiming they represent that community because they always have for, for you know, many, many years. And I think this is where, where we've got to really bring together um, and do more things like this with, you know, practitioners like Charmin, you know, um, researchers and educators like Indrani, people on the front like Zamzam doing an action research, still a cool title, I love that, action research officer. I always thought I wanted to be an astronaut till I met Zamzam and now I want to be <laughs> an action research officer. Um, and, and, and have those kind of conversations and say, well, what can we practically do? And of course, it actually involves us really, you know, going and standing in the city centre, getting a market stall and, and having to have conversations and knocking on doors and stuff. Well, of course, then you're into, that's what local politicians should do. That's what your city councillors should do, well, represent Sha people that way. Charmaine, what, what cut through with, with listeners when you, when, what, what traditionally, how, how did that change? So last year for when we went into lockdown and you, know, you had to really turn everything on its head and do things in a different way, but what cut through with the listener? I think to pick up on what um, Indrani mentioned earlier was about the mainstream media and the way they were portraying things and things which were coming through like a virus in its own right through on WhatsApp and in other languages and it was and then with the radio what we tried to achieve was something else which was that positive messaging positive storytelling you know so when we're talking about how Ramadan is different this is very different Ramadan so we had the mosques, which were suddenly closed, so that social element of people coming together for their night prayers was gone. The social element around um, coming together to break the fast was gone, you know, and people are just like, they don't know how to approach this. This is totally new. This is, you know, um, you've got people who are going to feel very, very isolated as a result. So it was about not giving more negativity, but thinking about positive ways. So changing that messaging around for people and sort of giving examples. So actually, you know, although the mosques are closed, you can pray together as a family in your house and that's perfectly acceptable. You don't actually have to be in a mosque. It's not going to make your Ramadan any less spiritual. And within that, people found, um, found that helpful to have those kind of um, alternative ways 
to approach that month, the month of Ramadan, um, in a way which is still be uh, spiritual um, and still gain um, something out of it and staying safe, you know. So the other thing as well, when we, we realized we were still going to do, we were going to be celebrating Eid in lockdown. There again, we created a programming around, you know, having an expert, having one of the doctors come on and talk about some of the things that they could be doing to keep safe. Um, having people come in talking about um, what to do with the children, different activities, um, setting up little things like everybody that we have a Zoom boom. Um, so, you know, creating those links that we created in our own family a link for the whole extended family. And, so, you know, everyone from Scotland, London, wherever they were, could come on and join in with this meeting and, and celebrate Eve together. Um, I live with my mother in law. So, we had to sort of think about the the seriousness of people coming in and saying, oh, actually you can't come in and visit. So there are many multi-generational households within the community. So thinking about that and giving messaging around that, that you know what, it might be fair enough, it'll be okay for you, but you have to think about who you're living in and the risk that you're bringing home. So, you know, being, it's okay to be able to say, no, people can't come and visit and here are some alternative ideas. So I think that was, again, it comes to giving that positive messaging Talk, having people sharing their stories and what they're doing and how they're doing things a bit differently this year, that particular year, and um, thinking about strategies to keep safe, but at the same time, still making the most out of that month of Ramadan, for example. And I think that was the key thing, um, the positive messaging um, and practical messaging at the same time. Zam Zam, in terms of the, the podcast that you were producing, which is the hardest group that you found language community in Leicester to to engage with? Is is because the assumption is you know kind of there's um, you know Hindu community, uh, the Pakistani community. I'm, I'm I'm using terms off the top of my head, so I'm not getting them all right. You know, but there's there's the Eastern the the hardest group for COVID vaccine take up to reach in the West End of Leicester is over fifties. Uh, East Europeans. Um, did you, have you learned anything from the process of, of producing the podcast that actually the people that are, there are some people who are, or if you like more engaged and better covered than others? Is that something that came out of it? Yeah, I mean, um, as you said, Eastern European. I mean, it was to be start with, it was really hard to find a doctor um, within Leicester or Leicestershire or Rutland. Um, that was Polish speaking to sort of, uh, to engage and, and have part in it. Uh, so we had to um, extend our search to London, um, which we found um, uh, somebody over there. So that was quite good. Uh, but in terms of, um, I've lost my train of thought. In terms of what I've learned of who's hard to engage, I suppose I will say um, the Polish community, um, would be because you know even though we don't acknowledge or realize it but they are the hardest they very um anti-vaccine um and they don't want to be vaccinated and it's a community that sort of um um they have sustained themselves for quite a long time so they feel like you know they they build these barriers among themselves that they want to kept um the barriers up they don't want to be mixing with other communities in a sense where you know, they're self-sustained and they're okay where they're at. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's what I've learned through what I was doing. Uh, but also, um, Romanian community, and I've also tried to um, reach out to Romanian and traveling community as well, which um, I'm still struggling to get hold of anyone in terms of finding anyone that will be able to um, support the work that we want to do. In Toronto, the, the the assumption is that in Leicester, it's kind of you know Leicester's a really interesting case study because of its diversity. You know, the high street near me, Narborough Road, seventy eight language communities are spoken, and that is seen and presented in a way as a kind of a good thing in itself. As it's hey, this is yeah, you know, we paint a rainbow and everybody's happy, but that doesn't demonstrate or it doesn't get into the antagonism and enmity that can exist between groups what's the what's the um 
often in if you like in marketing terms and communications terms it's about protecting the image of the city and protecting the brand what do we say to people as communications professionals that actually there's something that is more important than that 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 trumps that and actually we have a health emergency stop dealing with the image and deal with the engagement um what what's, what's the kind of how do we shift that around well you know this is a very good discussion <laughs> what i would say that we need to actually go back to basics and think ourselves as humans um, it's very interesting when I'm working because I do some of the other projects with children as well. It's very interesting how they very easily connect um, what they are learning in, in, in primary schools, which is called the human um, you know, geography and the physical geography. So there is this human geography, of course, where we are bringing, you know, building roads and stuff. And then there is this physical geography where we have got, um, you know, the um, the rivers and the trees and everything. Yeah. Now, for us, we have we have put on courts, many different kinds of courts. And we kind of always keep thinking in the light of who we want to be or what the kind of personality that we want to see or influenced by a film or influenced by a character that's being shown in cartoon, you know, from kids to us as adults. So I think that this is a very kind of a, um, a wave that has come through the digital media. And in all of that, you know, whether they be social media, whether they be cartoons, whether they be streaming culture, in all of those, we have lost ourselves as humans. We talk about language barriers. We talk about different religions. We talk about what kind of dresses we wear. We talk about, you know, when we eat, what we do in the morning habits and this and that. And in everything, we kind of talk about the cultural differences. We talk about language barriers and all of it. We need to address, if we address, if we would have addressed, you know, what John was uh, making a point previously, that nothing was right previously, therefore, how can we build better? If we have not understood the, those human basic necessities where we are talking as human beings, okay, not as Christians, as Muslims, as Hindus, not as somebody who speaks Bengali, somebody who speaks Gujarati, somebody who speaks uh, some other languages, but we are all humans, we eat, we live, and we earn to you kind of leave and all of that. So these basic connectors are, are missing very much. And this is a cooked up uh, kind of barrier, uh, which has been embedded very deeply in the society by, I would say, the capitalist media, you know? And, you know, I will go back to it and I will be quite, quite loud at that because I believe that the way people are thinking that needs to be brought back and they need to be reconnecting. They need to breathe properly, you know, which people are not. In the last one year, the kind of complications that we have seen, I believe that it has been very much around, you know, how, um, you know, to, to, to build the tension, like with the conversation that we started, possibly John mentioned at the beginning, that it's the narrative that's being built by the media, okay? Where is the variant coming from? South Africa. Where is it coming from? Brazil. Where is it coming from? India. At the same time, okay, you have got a headscarf on. Okay, it's Ramadan. Okay, are you a Muslim? Okay, well, there is a Hindu majority in um, Leicester. How does that fit in? Do you fit in with that? Well, you know, so you see, and, and these are all the narratives that the media cooks up, and then it, it, it kind of creates that barrier between human beings. So, you know, one simple answer would be, can we actually, when we are talking to another person, connecting with them, can we just remind them that we are all humans, you know? Like we say, cats and dogs are animals, we are humans. And that's the very basic thing that we need to possibly refocus on. John, I'm gonna move on in a, in, a, in, in a moment to think of this in kind of positive terms of what we can do about it. But one last kind of critical question is, you know, that, that um, is that structural? I mean, is, uh, is it structural or is it cultural? You you, you mentioned earlier about the you know, the, the the set the way that and everybody's talked about this the way the setup is that so deeply structured into that we we if it's structural we've kind of 
we, we don't know it's there. It's just the way the world is and we're supposed to accept it. If it's cultural, we've got some hand in it ourselves. We're, we're based on your experience of trying to do something in this gap, in this small space in between these things, where do, where do you have the most positive and the most negative um, impacts? I thought you'd given Indrani an impossible question and then you went and did, <laughs> then you went and did that to me. Can I swap questions with Indrani? Um, I, I, think, I think we need to, you know, we really need to, if, if we're gonna go back to basics and what we're looking at really, I think it's the, the role that we have, we've got to change the education system. You know, I, I'm afraid that, um, I mean, you, you three ladies all look a little bit younger than me, That's which, fa which is fantastic. Um, when I think back about school, I often say I spent sort of, you know, 10, 12 years at school learning everything that was important in the world. Then I went in the army for five years and learned about everybody that we shouldn't like and then spent the next 35 years realising all of that was wrong um, by going out and actually travelling the world and speaking to people. And one of the most amazing things about Leicester is all of those people from around the world are here. Um, and you, you can actually learn a lot about the world by being in Leicester and, um, and, and being, being based here and doing what I do. And I, find, I think I'm very lucky, including working with students. But I think one of the key things is really thinking about the education system, you know, particularly how we work with primary school children, where at some point, you know, those young people who don't see colour, disability, sexuality, gender, all that kind of suddenly start getting all of these opinions and feelings and then go to secondary school and then go into a system that's very much around you need to learn this to go on a journey to go here and of course they end up with Indrani and I at the age of 18 and you say to them well what do you think and then they look at you like you're completely mad you say, what do you mean what do I think and you go well, yeah, but what do you think and I, I can hear your parents I can hear the newspaper you read. I can hear the podcast you listen to. I can hear the political party you believe in. But what do you think? And I think this is the challenge that we've really got, because as adults, we can sit here and have this really important, meaningful conversation. And hopefully others will listen to it and we can influence, influence them in a positive way. They will then look at us as people that they can trust to tell them the truth, uh, hopefully with some facts, as, as Indrani mentioned. But at the same time, we're still only dealing with people that want to then listen to the podcast, that want to come into our bubble and hear the message. What we, We're not able to influence people at the moment in a way where we don't have it reflected in you know, the, the, uh, the sort of, you know, popular culture. Um, it's amazing the work that, you know, things like, you know, the uh, EastEnders does in actually bringing to play lots of disabilities and different things that people have and stuff like that but we don't have anything where people can go involved you know question time it's pantomime at best um you know with with, with a range of people so how do we how are we going to change society the only way we're going to do that is turn around and say we live in a fractured world that has, has has been built by these systems so we need to go to education and start empowering young people like zam zam who can go through the education system still amazingly be open to can we actually influence and push back against the capitalist media and the way the world is and, you know, this kind of never ending cycle of stuff that we seem to be involved in? And how do we encourage our young people to be the ones that go through the system, that the system can be changed and improved for all? You know what I mean? So we are actually fact humans. Imagine the census document we've just filled in. If it took all of that out and came in from the fact, OK, first of all, let's acknowledge the fact that you are human. Now answer these questions. Do you have a God? You know what I mean? Do you have it? Where do you live? What do you watch? Amazing how the census will come out with something that was actually going to be structurally and useful to us for planning a society that we want, as opposed to um, you know, the system that we have at the moment. Charmaine, the compelling stories and community radio as a platform for sharing compelling stories, what would you say are the uh, are the the benefits of that. It's interesting because I'm really touched by what John and um, Indirani have just been talking about, that human element. And one of the things about community radio is that opportunity to bring people together from different faiths and talk about things which we have in common, which is one of the things that we certainly did last year. You know, we had representatives of all the different communities in Leicester, some of, not all of them, because it's, 
John has made quite clear, it seems like we have the whole world in Leicester. Um, but just bringing in some of those people to come in and talk about their experiences, some of the challenges that they face. And actually a lot of the challenges that we are facing are similar. And um, in terms of the using sort of radio, community radio, or any sort of community media in a, in a compelling way, it is bringing that human element back to the storytelling. It comes back to that storytelling thing. You can have, you know, these Facebook posts, do not do this, do this, do that, the do's and the don'ts. But actually, it's it's about how we are living that in our in our lives. And one of the things I think I when you when you sort of watch what was happening or we're thinking about thinking about, for example, one of the things that I've noticed through um through the through social media sadly was the dehumanization of the healthcare profession that you know the the people just couldn't see them as being human beings with families to go home to with other responsibilities or any any aspect of them being human anymore and part of where um community radio and community media or changing or shifting that social media narrative is about sort of bringing that human element in, you know, his, you know, the ones which work well were the sort of having a doctor on and saying, well, actually not just do's and don'ts, but actually this is how my life has been affected. This is what I've seen patients go through with. This is what, you know, has been a knock on effect for people. This is what long COVID is, this is, and so forth. And that, that I think is really important. It is about giving that sort of, it's an authenticity and also capturing that human story for it to to resonate with people um, in in a way that has said this bullet point do's and don'ts don't quite reach in the same way. Sam Zam, what have you learned uh, about the those human stories? What's been important for you that you've taken from the work that you've done? What what's I think has something has any of those stories touched you? Uh, have you taken them on board? Have you shifted your position and your ideas on hearing those stories? Absolutely. I mean, um, it, it has, and uh, what I've learned is um, it's very important, very vital to have you know people's voices within the work that I do, uh, because without them, how without them, how is that going to be shaped into um, you know or in, impact on policies? Hopefully. Um, it's important to hear uh, what they have to say and it's important to hear it from them. Um, that's the only way we can make the change that, you know, they want to see and they we can empower them to actually do that for themselves as well. So I suppose that's what I've learned. And how, how, how would you apply that in the future? So you're working with colleagues, you're having conversations and, you, you know, you're working with people in the future about developing a communication strategy for something. What are you going to say to them there? Having the voice, yeah, I suppose having the voices of the people that you really want to reach is very important. Um, and that's one thing I will say, having the voices of the communities in any type of work, especially public health, is very, very important because how are you meant to shape something if you haven't got the input of the people that you're meant to be serving um, in there? So that I suppose that that is the, the most vital thing that I will say. Indrani. How do we structure this? How, how do we put this in a working framework that gets fed through into the system so that um, communications practitioners in the future understand the vital role, as Zamzam described, of how important these stories are? Well, I think it has already started because, um, you know, during the last one year, People, I know that, you know, lots of people, they have shifted from the mainstream media to podcasts, to uh, listening to community radio, reading, blogging, uh, you know, bloggers and following them and influencers and looking into more sort of stories that where, where people are saying what is actually happening in the ground level. So if we want to feed that into the structure, I believe that we need to show that there are some, some examples that has worked out. And at the moment, that's what we are also trying to do, you know, in our research projects and in the other projects that we are working on. We are trying to build, bring in the community at the center and so that they are actually influencing 
what kind of messages should go out? What should be done? You know, what kind of recovery does Leicester need uh, when it comes to businesses? What kind of, uh, what are the languages? How many languages should we use? And why these use of languages should be quite central to when we are giving out? Because, of course, the messages that's going out in Leicester, it, it is not actually, um, you know, confined to Leicester. It is going out because there are lots of people who are at different other places around the globe who look forward to these people who think that we have got very good public health communications. Therefore, the facts, the figures, the kind of messages coming out from the uh, public health England is going to actually help them understand what's happening in their country. So I think the model of communication is very, very important. And as Zamzam was saying, that it's very, very much central to, to the function and to crafting of it. So whenever we are doing projects, I believe that it's very important that NHS, if they are working on some kind of messaging, they need to have community volunteers participating in that process or they might have some recruiters who can actually help them, you know, to, to work with the community. And also at the same time, I think developing or working with social psychologists is quite important because messages without understanding how it actually um, gets processed by individuals is not going to help anyone. You know, we will produce more clutter. We will have more kind of, you know, digital carbon pollution and whatever you can name it. But the thing is that it's going nowhere, you know, apart, you know, just bringing back to that, um, uh, you know, just reminds me of an example that, um, you know, a, a story, actually, I met a, a lady, she's a, she's a Polish lady, and she, um, her, her dad was in Poland. And of course, he had the first shot of vaccine. He was doing fine. But then after three days, he ended up in a hospital in Poland. And eventually, after two days, um, you know, he expired. And the lady who is here, of course, daughter, she thinks that it was the vaccine. So you see how it's coming. So she was kind of convincing me, trying to convince that, you know, don't get, get the vaccine because, of course, you know, this is what have happened to my dad. He was fine. And then he went to hospital. Then he had the vaccine. And now he's not there anymore. So, so there are a whole lot of this, like, you know, cross-border complexities that troubles, the stories trouble and all of that. So I think we need to be a bit more cautious and, and thinking about the language, but also keeping our eyes open to how or what is happening in other countries, you know? Yeah, that, that, that the internationalization of this is one of the factors which is much uh, uh, not included in the conversation. It's 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 you know it's not it's it's largely unknown. It's unfactored into this, uh, John. In terms of the engagement that you've had with people around the world as you plan parallel lives um, conversations, have you noticed a shift in the kind of in the way that people are engaging? Are people ready to embrace? You know these. I mean, we're we're doing these things over you know Zoom. Uh, and and I've been able to have you know as as a as a, uh, a, a I don't know whether it was unintended, but as a consequence of the the lockdown, has been able to talk to people around the world easily over teleconferencing, which I would just wouldn't have been able to do. It would have taken six months and a visa application and a and an expensive air trip to go and do previously. Now we kind of just connect uh, uh, online. Has, has you know not for everybody, obviously, but for a small number of people. Has that shift been noticeable? Another, another good question, isn't it? I mean, that's, yeah, do we have enough time? Um, I think what we've got to understand here is that we've lost what community means uh, in the UK. You know, what, what actually constitutes a community. We use it more as a way of labelling people and putting them in that community rather than what is community. And so, you know, I think, you know, if, if I went to Cambodia now and visited some of my colleagues there who are in sort of red zones in Phnom Penh, you know, people you've met as well, Rob, when we both went together, then, you know, I could lose my wallet there. I'd get fed by a stranger, taken in by a stranger, taken to the embassy to get my new passport by a stranger, taken to the airport by a stranger and probably given some money for the flight by a stranger. That would not happen to you in Leicester or probably anywhere in the UK. You'd have to be very lucky. 
Okay, so these people also have, have got some very good, these people, people uh, that I talk to also have existing community structures and networks for disseminating information, not, not, not built on Facebook and social media and stuff like that, because it's still there. There's still that understanding of what real community means. Now, you know, my parents live with me. My dad is, he's 81, you know, and he talks about growing up in the East End of London, where I'm from. And he talks about, you know, no one shut their door and everybody knew everybody and everybody knew their neighbor and stuff like that. And, you know, there was a collective, they all had nothing. So therefore they left their front doors open. And I think somehow with, by buying into this, you know, consumer society, what we've got to have as well. And, you know, at the haves and the have nots that's all social media is just played straight into that so suddenly you know because you've got facebook pages and groups that you automatically can assume and you, you assume you can get to the people that need to be spoken to and so when something like the edl protests come along in 2010 and 2012 you know that also exposed the fact that when people spoke about community and they've gone to speak to the community leaders they intended they tended to be people of faith communities yeah. So suddenly the city councillors had to challenge themselves to go and knock on the doors of their wards because um, unless you're, you know, if you didn't go to a church or you didn't have a faith, then that was the person that represented you, those community leaders. This has exposed the game that what we really have is we have all of these people that rub along in Leicester in their in their own little little areas. We all might know each other, but we all go home and live in our own little areas that suddenly how do you communicate those messages when no one can go out? You know what I mean? When you don't go into work to meet those people, when you don't have those conversations at the school gate, when you don't meet with groups changing over at community centres, how do you then get those messages done? Well, we just revert to systems that we think are good for communicating stuff, which is the radio, the TV and the, and the newspaper. If you don't watch those, how else are you going to get it? Well, unless someone's taken the time to get it to the community through the right channels, not just the ones that aim or say they represent communities then there are always going to be people that miss out. And I think this is what we really need to be thinking about, you know, is going right back to basics now. And this, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very clear on this, you know, and I'm very passionate about it from what I've seen with Citizens Eye. If Citizens Eye still existed, would we have done a good job? I think we would have done a better job than it got done. Um, we probably would have been missing people out and all that sort of stuff. Why? Because as Zamzam said and Indrani mentioned there, there's still communities that don't want to engage, even though they're there. So, you know, where, where is the reality between how do we get to the people that need to, to get the messages? It's because people need to make some extra effort to do that. And of course, the system's not designed to get extra effort. It's, I put the information there. If you can't access it, that's your problem. And I think that's what we need to address. I want to try and finish up on which, which, a, a positive note, because we're, we're none of us are here because... We are doom mongers. I mean, I might be. Uh, that might be my role. Uh, you know, Cassandra's and doom mongers. However, we're actually here because we're committed to something which is a better way of doing things in the future. Um, I'm presuming. And what would what is that story that you want to see told, Charmaine? I'll I'll give the others a bit more time to think about this. If you give us a first answer, you can come back at the end and give us a second answer if you develop it. If you need time to develop it, but. What is that? You know, what would, what's the message you want to pass on to your kids? Because you're really passionate about how your children are brought up and, you know, what, what the future is that they, they face. What, what are we going to be telling that generation about how we share our communications? And, you know, it, it, it's kind of, it's not good enough to just ignore things and ignore the problems. We need, but we need, we can't, we need, it's that, implanting that memory or uh, anticipating the future memory that we're going to implant that it's using indrani's term what's what's that for you really interesting question that um i think one of the things is with the pandemic has been really really interesting because i've got young ones a, a nine nine yes twins and then a seven-year-old and and i said living with my mother-in-law who doesn't speak English very, you know, very well. So for that whole sort of diverse mix in the one household, one of the things which is quite interesting with the children is how quickly they have picked up all the messaging and how easy they have digested it and made it incorporated into their life. It's the small things like even when we 
have gone to go visit my parents. They've come home half asleep, take the hand sanitizer down, sanitize the hands, half asleep, gone up to bed to protect my mother-in-law, their grandma. So they've taken on the messaging quite well. And I think they're a generation where communication is is it's constant and it's open. And then one of the one of the things about it for me is is having that those conversations where they've had questions, trying to answer them in a in a way that they can understand. And at the same time, doing the same thing with my mother-in-law, where she's not, you know, the barrage of WhatsApp messages in different languages, which I don't understand fully. Um, or then just things like the prime minister's speech, which he didn't understand. She's sitting there with us, watching it, doesn't have a clue what's going on. And then trying to ask us in between, bless, you know, what did he say? I said, mom, I'll explain everything afterwards. But again, it's then explaining to the kids what he's saying in a very basic way, and then explaining to mom in our language, what um, in our mother tongue about what, what's being said and how that's gonna affect us. And so it's about conversation. For me, it is about conversation and being, you know, less reliant on just, you know, the digital is great, but even with social media, actually, it's not just about posting, it's about having conversations. So there was a time when I, I got to a stage where I got really tired of people posting misinformation and I hate being a keyboard warrior and I hate being the thought of being trolled by people online, but I thought, no, enough's enough. So I went out and I'd post, I'd, have you read the article, the link you've just posted, because actually it says totally something different, you know, and challenging the narratives online, um, come what may, and invariably those people who are posting those conspiracy narratives, you know, did all, went off somewhere else. But it's about conversations, and also about making, raising awareness, and this is a show I did a few years back, actually, on the radio, is what research shows. So one of the things I think that we're lacking across the board, which has been exposed to me, is the ability to recognize or understand what is trustworthy, what is reliable, what is robust, having any kind of skill set to do that. And I think that's really important. So when somebody sent you a video, the WhatsApp video, when you cut, you know, the ones you get where you cut the aubergine and there's a scorpion coming out, which is totally and utterly being just made up and, you know, things being put together. But you know, when you watch something like that, and you think, oh, that looks real. But that ability to sort of say, well, actually, no, that's not real. And this is what can be done with video. And this is what you have to understand. Um, and, and creating that challenging, that questioning, that, that challenging and questioning what's coming towards you and not just taking it on face value. So conversations and challenging the narratives I mean, not being scared to challenge, asking those difficult questions. You know, is that real? Why, you know, why if we're in a pandemic is such and such person doing this? Are they supposed to be doing that? You know, and they're, they're difficult questions because you don't want to make someone look bad, but equally at the same time, you have to be able to sort of think, and also sort of saying, you know, whatever other people are doing, it's about how you keep yourself safe and understanding that you can only do what you can keep to keep yourself safe in a pandemic and the ones around you as safe as possible. Um, so it's about that for me. The other thing I did want to say is one of the things that, and it comes again bound down to the challenge, one of the things that I feel has been missed in terms of um, the communication strategy as a whole across the board and, and came up in a very unexpected way was the barrage of negativity and the barrage of this conspiracy narratives and so forth. Um, and I think that's one thing that going forward would be really important to look at when you're putting together any kind of communication strategy around health is not just to give the right messages, but anticipate some of the um, anti messages, if you will, and to build that within into your, into your communication strategy. Because right at the very beginning and outset, all of the key main pages around health on, on Facebook you'd have people literally posting on there, oh, here comes a conspiracy theory brigade. And rightly, they would. And the pages which were designed to give the right information were actually becoming hosts to all the misinformation. And I think that's really key going forward because social media is not going anywhere. It is here to stay. And one of the things we can do is to look at what might be coming and what is is there and how we combat those negative narratives with positive ones using storytelling as we've spoken about before as much as possible so that we are 
engaging in an authentic way. Zamzam, what would be your positive intervention? I think I'll um, echo what Shamin is saying and also having a community space where you actually get to discuss and have an important discussions um, is what I would say because we, we don't seem to have that um, at all. Um, there's no anywhere that communities can congregate and speak about issues that's actually happening with them um, and within them. So I think that's that is really important and that's what I would encourage. And also, you know, every single one of us um, have a duty of care of actually, you know, I suppose educating, there's a lot of ignorance out there, um, educating people in terms of, you know, misconceptions and, and what they believe and stuff and just saying, look, sit, sitting down with somebody and, and having that conversation is vital because with the dialogue, um, hopefully comes with an understanding. John, what about you? Well, I wasn't expecting that. Well, I'll, I'll, you were out of sequence then, Rob. Uh, okay. moved, everybody's uh, moved around on my screen. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I was thinking, I'm, I'm going to listen to what Indrani says now, and then you came to me. To no, I thought I'd me. switch so, yeah. it around a little bit. <laughs> um, a, pos a positive intervention. Again, I think, I think you know, Sh Charmin and Zamzam said, you know, said there, you know, you, you've got to, we've got to just view people as as people you know we're all different we all you know we all believe in different things and all that but ultimately we have a shared humanity i think talking to to people it's easy when you say to them about you know there's an ebola outbreak or there's a bird flu like av avian flu and stuff like that and they'll tell you where it was and maybe how long it was or maybe how many there were but there was always that perception that we were immune to it um not physically immune, as in immune to it arriving in the UK. And I think what COVID has done is presented, I suppose, quite a unique opportunity if, if for those of us that are willing to kind of pick up the rubble of the wall that's been pushed down and try to build back better, maybe using that term, um, is the fact that, you know, we've got this shared connection. I mean, you've seen it in some of the messages, haven't you? You know, you know we're so... Britain's first in vaccinating everybody and, you know, everybody's got this. And go, well, that's all pretty pointless if we don't help people in locations like India, where there's lots of our population have family. You know what I mean? So there's that kind of travel side. So suddenly, you know, we, maybe it will get us to think a little bit more about how we are connected with people. Um, and, that you know, um, you know, through flying and stuff like that, that ultimately now the world is a, is a much smaller place. And we need to be taking care of, of people. It's, it's very easy at the beginning of, pan, of the pandemic to sit and watch on the news, you know, as God knows how many Indians who live on, you know, subsistence of you know, every day at train stations, for example, suddenly all going home. You know, this mass, almost a biblical exodus of people, you know, cycling sort of two, three hundred kilometres, even further to get home and taking family members and thinking, well, what that, why doesn't that happen here? I think, you know, we, we, we really need to be thinking about that we've got this shared humanity. I remember my, my final story here, someone from um, Radio Leicester rang me up and uh, just before I went on air, they were talking about something to do with the pandemic and this, you know, the producer was just like, you know, John, how are you coping? You know, I mean, you know, my dad went through the blitz. Okay, so let, let, let's get this in context. My parents are downstairs, I've got the internet, Netflix is working. I can talk to you on Radio Leicester because I've got Wi-Fi. Um, I don't, we're not being bombed. We've got enough food downstairs. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to get my parents to Dover to pay a complete stranger all of our life savings to go to France and will we be welcomed? I'm not suffering. Let's get it in context. Yeah. There's and and this and this is the thing. It's that we're we're constantly fighting this. Oh, nationalistic, bulldog spirit, patriotic, Churchill, we're, we're, we're going to beat this. You know, it's the narrative. And it is incredibly dangerous. Now, people have said to me, John, oh, you're so incredibly woke. You know, and all I'd say is, well, actually, I'm incredibly awake, really. And, and what you need to do is take a really good look around you. Yeah, because if you think we're all in this together, you are completely wrong. Indriani, your positive thoughts what do you think would is is going to bridge that kind of gap that that uh the danger is i suppose is is kind of fatalism isn't it um and, and the lack of perspective 
I mean, you know, it's a, it's an essential reminder that other countries are going to be facing the pandemic, and other people in lots of other places are going to be facing the the the, the horrors of the pandemic for a long time, unless us in the privileged West uh, engage with things, <laughs> en engage with people in a the world in a different way. Um, what what is that positive message that you would you, you know communicate to other people to say actually we can do something about this we can be part of the solutions for this well yeah so you know um of course i mean uh, rob you you were in that team as well like the mutual aid um and the thing is that of course for the last two years you know we were kind of working still with the community of course in between the pandemic came and all of that at some point last last year we decided that we have to create something a network a very grassroots level um space where people will come and engage and talk about very freely without actually fearing anything and we came up with this idea of celebrating our similarities you know so when the media is actually showing uh, a very much of a, um, a narrative that they have built around how different we are, I think repositioning how similar we are is very important to kind of see the other side of that narrative. And what we are doing now is we are actually trying to build that part by part. And part of that, like it's, it's very exciting because, um, you know, when India, of course, the situation that's happening there, and you know that because there is a um, you know, lot of people here who have got still connections there, but also there are people here who know people there, you know, so somehow it's very much, you know, culturally or, or in some ways um, connected. And lots of people from yesterday, they have got calls, you know, and, and they have been actually, um, you know, working, um, within NHS or working somewhere in Leicester, but also there are business owners who have contacted and said, well, are you doing something? Can we do something? Can we send out something to the families there? Do you know someone? Can we actually channelize this through the media? And I said, and then we came up very quickly of the idea of creating an international mutual aid. So at the moment we are building it. So one thing we are doing is we, we are we are going to have a documentary of the whole pandemic, of what Leicester has gone through and all of that. So we have started to think about crowdfunding, which of course, luckily, like the university has said that they are going to help us with that as well. So we'll, we'll see where we get with that. But I think that narrative needs to be there. That's absent, you know. So also we had this conversation that so say, for example, whenever you go different cities or, or different places in um, in uh, United Kingdom, you will find that in their museums, there are pockets where they have got the history. Leicester, in, a, in Leicester, we don't have that, you know, and the history that we have got in the museums, it's very much religious histories, which shouldn't have happened. You know, it has been constructed again. It has been a careful construction. Uh, and careful structural penetration has happened to create that history. Now, I believe that in Leicester, if we have to change that narrative, if we have to come out of that, and of course, all of that media attention that we have got not coming out of the pandemic, we need to position that alternative voice, alternative narrative, and alternative spaces where communities feel free to come out and talk. You know, it doesn't matter whether they talk fluent English or they talk broken English. The important thing is that they can communicate whatever language it might be. And I think that freeness, you know, when we are saying that you are free and this is West and we are free, that concept needs to be re-embedded possibly um, to counter the hatred narrative, you know. And if we go back to the basics of humans, you will see automatic reduction in hate crime, you know, stereotyping people, thinking about people, just looking at them, we are, you know, um, thinking who they are and what they can do and all of that. So, yeah, that's, that's what I think, you know. Well, let's look at how in the future that we can use our community media platforms, our mutual aid media platforms, our community focused communication techniques and platforms and skills and expertise. To, to really connect with that sense of value, what connects us rather than what 
makes us different. I think that if we're if that's our starting point, that would be fantastic. Just want to say thank you very much to everybody. It's been a really fascinating conversation. Uh, thank you to Charmaine Shulman, uh, Indrani Lah- Lahiri. I can never get names right. <laughs> okay, John Costa and Zamzam Yusuf. Uh, the recording will be made available on the Germs Journey website. I've been Rob Watson, and it's been a fascinating series of conversations. And hopefully we'll be able to continue it in other forms on different platforms. So thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a Germs Journey discussion, a conversation about the importance of public health communication. To find out more, visit our website, germsjourney.com, or follow us on Twitter and Instagram at germsjourney.